apologized for his stay, was grieved to have kept her waiting, and anxious to get her away without further loss of time, and before the rain increased. And in another moment they walked off together, her arm under his, a gentle and embarrassed glance, and a "'Good morning to you,' being all that she had time for, as she passed away. As soon as they were out of sight, the ladies of Captain Wentworth's party began talking of them. "'Mr. Elliot does not dislike his cousin, I fancy.' "'Oh, no! That is clear enough. One can guess what will happen there. He is always with them. Half lives in the family, I believe. What a very good-looking man!' "'Yes, and Miss Atkinson, who dined with him once at the Wallaces, says he is the most agreeable man she ever was in company with. She is pretty, I think, Anne Elliot. Very pretty, when one comes to look at her. It is not the fashion to say so, but I confess— I admire her more than her sister. Oh, so do I. And so do I. No comparison. But the men are all wild after Miss Elliot. Anne is too delicate for them. Anne would have been particularly obliged to her cousin, if he would have walked by her side all the way to Camden Place, without saying a word. She had never found it so difficult to listen to him, though nothing could exceed his solicitude and care, and though his subjects were principally such as were wont to be always interesting. Praise, warm, just, and discriminating, of Lady Russell, and insinuations highly rational against Mrs. Clay. But just now she could think only of Captain Wentworth. She could not understand his present feelings, whether he were really suffering much from disappointment or not, and till that point were settled, she could not be quite herself. She hoped to be wise and reasonable in time, but alas, alas, she must confess to herself that she was not wise yet. Another circumstance very essential for her to know was how long he meant to be in Bath. He had not mentioned it, or she could not recollect it. He might be only passing through. But it was more probable that he should be come to stay. In that case, so liable as everybody was to meet everybody in Bath, Lady Russell would in all likelihood see him somewhere. Would she recollect him? How would it all be? She had already been obliged to tell Lady Russell that Louisa Musgrove was to marry Captain Benwick. It had cost her something to encounter Lady Russell's surprise, and now, if she were by chance to be thrown into company with Captain Wentworth, her imperfect knowledge of the matter might add another shade of prejudice against him. The following morning Anne was out with her friend, and for the first hour, in an incessant and fearful sort of watch for him in vain, but at last, in returning down Pulteney Street, she distinguished him on the right-hand pavement, at such a distance as to have him in view of the greater part of the street. There were many other men about him many groups walking the same way, but there was no mistaking him. She looked instinctively at Lady Russell, but not from any mad idea of her recognizing him so soon as she did herself. No, it was not to be supposed that Lady Russell would perceive him till they were nearly opposite. She looked at her, however, from time to time, anxiously, and when the moment approached which must point him out, though not daring to look again, for her own countenance she knew was unfit to be seen, she was yet perfectly conscious of Lady Russell's eyes being turned exactly in the direction for him, of her being, in short, intently observing him. She could thoroughly comprehend the sort of fascination he must possess over Lady Russell's mind, the difficulty it must be for her to withdraw her eyes, the astonishment she must be feeling that eight or nine years should have passed over him, and in foreign climes and in active service, too, without robbing him of one personal grace. At last Lady Russell drew back her head. Now, how would she speak of him? "'You will wonder,' said she, "'what has been fixing my eye so long? But I was looking after some window-curtains, which Lady Alicia and Mrs. Frankland were telling me of last night. They described the drawing-room window-curtains of one of the houses on this side of the way, and this part of the street, as being the handsomest and best hung of any in Bath, but could not recollect the exact number, and I have been trying to find out which it could be. But I confess, I can see no curtains hereabouts that answer their description." Anne sighed and blushed and smiled, in pity and disdain, either at her friend or herself. The part which provoked her most was that, in all this waste of forethought and caution, she should have lost the right moment for seeing whether he saw them. A day or two passed without producing anything. The theatre or the rooms, where he was most likely to be, were not fashionable enough for the Elliots whose evening amusements were solely in the elegant stupidity of private parties, in which they were getting more and more engaged, and Anne, wearied of such a state of stagnation, 
sick of knowing nothing, and fancying herself stronger because her strength was not tried, was quite impatient for the concert evening. It was a concert for the benefit of a person patronized by Lady Dalrymple. Of course they must attend. It was really expected to be a good one, and Captain Wentworth was very fond of music. If she could only have a few minutes' conversation with him again, she fancied she should be satisfied, and as to the power of addressing him, she felt all over courage if the opportunity occurred. Elizabeth had turned from him, Lady Russell overlooked him, her nerves were strengthened by these circumstances. She felt that she owed him attention. She had once partly promised Mrs. Smith to spend the evening with her, but in a short hurried call she excused herself and put it off, with the more decided promise of a longer visit on the morrow. Mrs. Smith gave a most good-humoured acquiescence. "'By all means,' said she, "'only tell me all about it when you do come. Who is your party?' Anne named them all. Mrs. Smith made no reply, but when she was leaving her, said, and with an expression half serious, half arch, "'Well, I heartily wish your concert may answer, and do not fail me to-morrow if you can come, for I begin to have a foreboding that I may not have many more visits from you.' Anne was startled and confused, but after standing in a moment's suspense, was obliged, and not sorry to be obliged, to hurry away. End of chapter 19